We seem to be at the age where life stops giving us things and starts taking them away. I think they tried. I honestly do. Hi, let's take an in-depth look at Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Let's get the most obvious thing out of the way first. Dial of Destiny isn't a great movie, but it is an entertaining one that is as good as an adventure movie with this many cooks, writers, producers, four delays, and an 80-year-old lead can be. And yes, I would have preferred to have seen Martin and Denis Villeneuve's version. Yes, the prisoners of Blade Runner 2049 and Dune Denis Villeneuve, but I'm glad Harrison Ford wanted James Mangold for this because it could have turned out a lot worse with somebody else. I honestly think they tried, but it's hard to make a good movie and even harder to make a good Indiana Jones movie. And the fourth one is a perfect example of that. And being completely honest, I'm not that fond of the second one either. And both of them were made by Steven Spielberg himself. You're a teacher? Part time. Set in 1969 and facing retirement, Indy has pretty much given up on life when his goddaughter drags him into a swashbuckling adventure featuring Nazis, magical science, and convenient happenings that nobody has heard of before. Ultimately, the entire movie boils down to a simple father-daughter story with both of them looking for the family they have lost, their self-worth, acceptance, and forgiveness with some Indiana Jones nostalgia to wrap it all up. And Mangold does a good job of imitating Spielberg's style as far as that's possible. The beginning 15 to 20 minutes are particularly Indiana Jones, with a typically cocky indie, a lot of moving parts, absurd misfortunes, luck, bad luck, irony, and some charming and situational humor thrown into the mix, while also setting up the premise of the movie and introducing us to the villain. You have we met? My memory is a little fuzzy. Are you still a Nazi? The rest of the movie doesn't fare that well though, as the pace drops considerably after this and it has a hard time deciding if it wants to be a father-daughter story or an adventure movie and gets stuck somewhere in between, with too many attempts at humor or action. And I would have wished for more character exchange and less of the latter, not only because the relationship would have needed it, but also because a tired and old Indy and Ford would have benefited from it, which could have resulted in a more emotional farewell. Also, Phoebe Waller-Bridge and Harrison Ford work pretty well together, and I would have loved some more banter, teachable moments, and mentorship between them, as Waller-Bridge does a great job of bringing across the curiosity for being an archaeologist, and it would have given Ford more time to show off his fatherly and stoic charm. The biggest disappointment though is Matt Mickelson's villain Dr. Foller. Not because of Mickelson himself, mind you, he's terrific in portraying this somewhat confused, easily irritated, but clumsy Nazi villain, which is baffling when you know how intense of a presence he can be. And his German is pretty spot on as well. But just like in Spielberg's movies, this one still tends to portray the Nazis as a comedic and confused punching bag rather than an actual threat. Fola is never really an antagonist, but a scared puppy running after them. I would have much preferred Thomas Kretschmann's Colonel Weber as the antagonist, as he's much more of a presence to be reckoned with, motivated not only by his beliefs, but also by his fear of failure. He's a much more serious and fierce character, which the movie would have needed to create more intensity and increase the stakes. All of which is brought to life with a mediocre visual presentation. The real life sets are pretty great and feature many densely literate elements that make them feel lived in. In this apartment in particular is a beautiful example of this as is the cafe in Tangier. Much of the rest doesn't fare that well though, as many of the sets feel empty and lifeless, while India and Helena are just passing through those. None of them have any scale to them or create any sense of wonder, awe or intrigue, which isn't surprising considering that most of the sets are so small that you can barely fit a few people into it. Say what you will about Crystal Skull, but the environments were impressive and creative and were brought to life through interaction with the cast. Dial of Destiny lacks all of that, and it's usually just a bland set extension none of the cast reacts to or interacts with. And what makes this worse is the subpar VFX throughout. Unfortunately, ILM hasn't managed to improve its VFX pipeline since, well, I'd say Duncan Jones's Warcraft in 2016. That movie's facial and muscle rendering actually looks more convincing in many scenes. ILM's material response and shading still don't look believable in most shots, which is particularly problematic with their skin rendering. Whether it's Leia in Rogue One, the young cast of The Irishman, Luke in the Mandalorian or Indy in this one, the skin has an unnatural glow and reflective sheen, making it look fake. If I had to guess, I'd say it's how the subsurface scattering works that causes this, and it's made even worse by the unnatural movement of the skin and muscles below it. It just looks unrealistic. And the same thing can be said about their eye rendering as well, which often makes the characters look dead inside. It almost feels as if ILM has been static since Lucas sold it to Disney, 
and they are far behind what Weta is doing in pretty much all regards. And this wouldn't be that big of an issue if it hadn't been used so liberally over the entire movie. Some of the rendering in the finale looks on par with some pre-rendered game cinematics and is made even worse by an over-reliance on keyframed animation instead of motion captured ones. And on the topic of cinematography, Feed and Papa Michael does an excellent job of imitating Spielberg's world and character building blocking style wherever the sets allow him to, which unfortunately isn't often. But he nails the romantic lighting style from the original trilogy. The castle, train and archive in New York in particular look fantastic. The rest ranges from overloaded, like the chase in Tangier, to more practical shots just to get it done. All of it, the entire movie really, feels rushed. The only element that is spot on is Williams' score, and it's not just themes from the other movies and the acoustic throwback, but this score is densely layered in a way that you don't hear often anymore. There's this part after the chase in Tangier where Indy and Helena connect for the very first time, and the score highlights this by adding an additional, softer and warmer track to the mix, making the overall mood feel warmer as well. The entire soundscape throughout with Skywalker Sound's insane arsenal is lovely. In conclusion, Dial of Destiny ironically feels like a rushed project that while not a great movie is saved by the sheer talent behind it and turned into an entertaining experience that, while mediocre in most categories, has a few genuine moments where it feels like Indiana Jones. And while it's not the farewell Indy would have deserved, if you want to see Indiana Jones take on one last adventure, you should definitely give this one a shot. What do you think you're doing, man? Get down! Dad, we're well out of range. With all that said, thank you Harrison Ford for two of the coolest action heroes in cinema history and farewell to you, Indiana Jones. And thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.